I am very happy here to take a little time to tell you that perhaps if one thing is asked, perhaps the first visible impact of NEP could be Chanakya. Let me tell you why. The people from the Chancellor, that's Professor M.K. Sir, and all the mentors that we have, have all been part of NEP. Exactly one of the reasons why these group of people came to us and say, now that you seem to have suggested so many things, why not put it in action? So therefore, very happy to say that we have learned an understanding of education from NEP and trying to put it across in the form of Chanakya University. For me personally, it's a very nostalgic trip because I studied in St. Aloysius, my schooling, I left Mangalore long time ago and very happy to be back. Point two, I am here in Chanakya as a teaching faculty because my greatest qualification is I was a PUC teacher. I started my career as a PUC teacher and we strongly believe that teachers exist only in PUC too. After that, we are all lecturers. We just talk. In that context, my understanding of teaching students and learning, I learned in my 10 formative years of starting my teaching career at the pre-university level. And even today, we believe that a teacher's test is actually how well he or she can connect to the children of the lowest order, the primary level. In that way, it's a very nostalgic trip. To me, I will not take much time. Just putting the context here, after 36 years or 34 years, a national education policy was conceived as necessary. Few reasons let me explain or let me present. Now, um, when a student or a child comes to the class, the most important thing as teachers we have to do is give the child an aspiration and then we have to help the child manage it. We have to facilitate that. But then I found it very, very difficult to communicate to the child or the student and what is the aspiration he should have. Let me explain. We have heard about a system of education that exists today which originated from uh, Babington Macaulay 160 years ago, in his very famous Macaulay's Minutes, he explains. Now, Macaulay, one phrase I quote, he says, he basically did not understand, neither like the education system as exists in India. In fact, he didn't like India. That's a different story. But he comes and says that education is understanding the physics of Newton, poetry of Milton, and philosophy of Locke, John Locke, he says. All else is just about language, he says. Now, with that kind of perspective and attitude, a certain system was conceived for India, and it continues. In this system, which seems to be a little out of context, it was always a challenge to basically train children and give them a sense of aspiration. Now, one more perspective. Knowledge economy, and today knowledge is available, ready-made. Now, in India, or our context, as NEP highlights, or as our heritage explains, that knowledge has three elements. Learning has three elements, the teacher, the knowledge, and the student. Now, knowledge, teacher, and the student, all are living organism. All three evolves, all three enriches in the exercise. But somehow, somewhere along the way, knowledge became, as teacher just mentioned, two months after the exam, you ask a child to write the same paper, the child doesn't know. So therefore, there was something given to him, understand it, forget it. Use the product, leave it away. So therefore, knowledge lost, lost its living capabilities. So knowledge, teacher, and the student are meant to be living organism which evolves. I think I'm sure all of you agree, and I know, Every year, we may be teaching a subject for 20 years, 15 years, and, but we don't repeat. We are not comfortable repeating. The concept may be the same, the example, the cases, the context changes. So we are learning so much. In fact, we learn from the students. In that context, the teacher, the knowledge element, and the student, all three evolves. So somewhere along the way, knowledge became a lifeless object. This is a major cause of concern. And the third most important thing, there are aspirational institutions in India, IITs, IIMs. These were set up basically to drive the new India immediately after independence. 
But then, somewhere in the 80s, 70s and 80s, IIT is of course, great place of learning, and they did, did create great amount of graduates. But unfortunately, most of them, for some justifiable or unjustifiable reason, left India and settled abroad. Now that's an absolute no problem, actually. But then, when a former planning commission member was asked the question about brain drain, he says, brain drain, as you really know, studying India and getting away, what do you think about brain drain? I know he is a planning commission deputy chairman. He says it's better to have brain drain rather than have brain in the drain. Now that's very shocking. Now if this is the kind of understanding of a certain system that we evolved, therefore there's a change of perspective needed. So NEP addressed those issues, gave a context, gave a purpose for that. In this context, let me take very little time in trying to present my perspective and experience. We were speaking to a director of IIT Darwad. PUC is where they choose a career and get on with that. We were talking to a director of IIT Darwad. IIT Darwad is the latest entry into the IITs, and we were talking to him. In an interaction, an engineering student asked his IIT director, Sir, we hear so much about IIT. It's a dream of every young boy or a child to be an IITian. Tell us something, what is so different about IIT, the students or the class experience? What the director said really shocked us. He took a little time and said, see my friend, IITs are now different. We are the same teachers, just like your teachers in a typical engineering college. And if you think all the IIT children who sit there in the class are all geniuses becoming innovators, wrong. Approximately, his statistics, approximately 70% of the children in an IIT class actually don't follow what's happening. In fact, they are there because they qualified an exam, a tough exam prepared and qualified. We feel sad that they are not prepared to be an engineer. Therefore, we went to those coaching centers to ask them, you people justifiably spend a lot of time preparing these children for IIT, JEE exam, and so many of them to us. But why are you not preparing them to be engineers? Then it seems the head of the coaching center said, Sir, please correction. We told them we will make them engineers. We never told them we'll make them good engineers. And there's a lot of difference. We'll send you to an engineering institution. Whether you'll turn out to be good or bad is your responsibility. This is shocking. This is saddening. So therefore, what's happening? A certain change of perspective is required. In that context, now I emerged, I, I evolved, or I, I changed from the PUC level and, and things like that. Now probably I have had a little experience in taking children from graduation or post-graduation into how to make them either employables or entrepreneurs. In that context, what perhaps are the major areas which the NEP highlights and how I take it away to look at is, I will summarize it with few dimension. The first one would be, I have Swami Vivekananda's picture here. Now, Swami Vivekananda's quote is very simple. Education is a realization of the divinity which already exists in humans. Today, education has become an acquisition of degree. Now, that's a lot of difference. So we seem to acquire without internalizing. What I'm trying to say is, first one, are we trying to make a fish fly? Are we trying to fit a certain system into a child? So therefore, essential thing is, what is that individual boy or girl essentially good at? That is kindly ignored. So it's more of an acquisition and awarding rather than facilitating an internalization of growth. Now that's where I talk about the sense of essential character and that's where this quote becomes very important for me. Great insight, just saying that it's an actually an internalization or a, a kind of a realization rather than acquisition. So therefore, to what extent we look at a child and make it special and feel that this is what it is and how it could grow on its own, evolve. Because we know evolution is a conscious process and character is a conscious development. You know, let me explain that further. Today, to my understanding, when I talk to a PU commerce child, commerce child who wants to be a CA, chartered accountant, they study well and they become chartered accountant. Very few such careers, children start from a very early year and consciously become what they wish to be. 
but most of otherwise, we all ended up, I take uh, your permission to say that, many of us ended up just like that. I don't know whether we evolved and consciously choose to become a, a doctor or, or a teacher. So that is perhaps the most important element. And here when I say this, this is where the concept of freedom and liberal education concept comes up. To what extent we are able to assess what the child is good for and help and facilitate its growth. Second one, let me talk about the cultural component of it. When I say cultural component, I take the example of a good engineer itself. Now, culture is what we represent. We represent a family, we represent a community, we represent a country, a profession, and these days the best way or the greatest way, in fact, the NAP and the, in recent times, the ministers and the scholars have been telling one of the greatest way institutions grow is through what is called as through alumni. It's called Harvard fallacy. There's an interesting theory on that. The point I'm coming to is, to what extent a child represents an idea represents a profession, represents a concept. Now, very simple. I am talking about, I am Sandeep Nair. Do I represent what I, what, I, what I carry on with me? So that sense of culture is missing. So that becomes important. And I'm not talking about national social culture, which is very important. But does he even represent a profession? Now, being a doctor, I'm telling you this, I mean, you know it. I was just, uh, somebody was just having a talk with me the other day, and says, he just told me, so I'm so sorry these days. Uh, it's so essential to take second or third opinion of a doctor. I don't know why. It becomes so difficult to, to, to trust some professional. That's very saddening, actually. Very, very saddening, disheartening, disturbing. So how do we enable a child to understand that they represent a certain culture and they represent the entire, you know, if I go abroad and misbehave somewhere, they don't say a man misbehaved, an Indian misbehaved. Now that's exactly what we carry on. A kind of, one teacher can have implications for, you know, ages to come, for millions to be there. So in that context, how do we help or enable a student to represent a culture, whichever they may choose to represent? The third element I talked about is curiosity. I was talking to a professor who spent nine years teaching in IIT Karakpur, perhaps one of the top five engineering colleges in India. He spent nine years and he left it. Because he could not get into the system, I'm not going into it. Now he said that, do you know sir, how the school system is structured? I said, I don't know. He says, a child of three to six years on an average, he said, asks 400 questions a day. I felt 400 a little too much, let me take 200. A child between the age of three, this he said it is proven. Three to six years, ask about, say, 400 questions a day. Parents get fed up of that. You know, we know it. We really get fed up of that. So what do parents do? Take the child and put in a school. And imagine, one parent, one child cannot handle 200 or even 20 questions. And there's a classroom with 30 children, 200 into 30. What will the teacher do? Don't ask questions. So, he said, this is how it happens. So, therefore, the art of... And when I say curiosity, I am not just asking questions. The the quest for knowledge and quest of research and the Google and the Evernet has completely spoiled it actually because everything is available, they don't ask right questions. The point I'm saying is the art of asking questions is the emergence of wisdom or the origin of research. Perhaps either we are teaching them so much, I'm reminded of the Zen story, you know, where I'll take a little time and a student goes to a Zen master and the student says, Master, I understand you're a wise old man, teach me something. Okay? So the student said, the Zen, the master asked some fruits to be brought. An apple is brought. The master bites the apple, chews it a little and keeps it on the plate and say, eat. The student gets disgusting. Master, this is not done. How can you do that? That's exactly the point. If you want me to give you the essence of what I learn, you'll be saddened. I will tell you how to grow an apple tree, grow an apple tree, get the fruit, eat it yourself. That was then. 
Today, children are given juice with a straw. So life is easy. So therefore, where is the question of curiosity? So therefore, the th third element is asking question. And then creativity. Knowledge is everywhere. Information is everywhere. When I say creativity, I'm not talking about creative thinking. It is. But here for me, creativity is looking at an answer. Right from the newspaper to the television media, we have problems all over the world. I mean, you, you listen to a television news channel, you think the world will come to an end tomorrow. I mean, you read a newspaper, you will never have a good day. Now, well, I'm not getting into the media uh, circus here, but the point is a child can be asked to look at the solution rather than a problem. And this, why I say this because one very deeply saddening affair is today, people who are extremely intellectual, either they are too cynical or too arrogant. They don't seem to be connecting at all, which takes me to the next question of collaboration. It was, a study was conducted across the world, it was found the one skill, communication, technology, all is over. The one skill the world is lacking is a skill of coordination or collaboration. Why I say this? Because India, in the world research index, is way below. Although, of course, we have to congratulate ourselves that we developed a COVID vaccine in shortest possible time, so we are capable of that. But the otherwise, the point is, we are way below in research index because research is a collaborative effort. Ma'am was talking about it. You know, engineering, for example, engineers will never be able to do or innovate as well as they can do if they don't know the society. So social science doesn't get integrated into technology or science. So everything is separated. So collaboration, teamwork. So these are the essential elements the NEP fosters and probably can drive education in terms of as a realization of what the objective is all about. And what we did was, Chanakya, this has been a great learning experience. You don't believe, we have been talking to a lot of academics. They say a concept of liberal education, which Madam mentioned about, a child should have the freedom to pursue what it wants. So combining knowledge, combining skills, and third very important element, we perhaps or there is a need to help a child to understand how to experience life the aesthetics of life, the beauty of nature, the, the magic of world and things like that. That, you know, as somebody was saying, we are all dead men walking. We just don't seem to notice everything. It's just life is getting on. So therefore, all these elements to be integrated and finally, you don't believe the emerging areas, universities today are coming out with a course which is called as Pursuit of Passion where not only that a student can pursue what they want, but they can curate a course. So a student will come and say, I would like to do study on Hindi films, commercial blockbusters. So design a course, you design a course and he studies. So that's a kind of future of education that is emerging because two things are important. One is we have to match with a technology driven era a knowledge-driven economy, and a flat world, a globalized world, a global village where everybody knows everybody. At the same time, there's a lot of legacy which has been ignored, a lot of heritage that's been neglected. So therefore, how to bring about a certain balance? And I strongly believe if this orientation is given, and I, 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 I you know, it's, it's an experiment. I think all of you will agree with me that whatever we are today is because we had that one inspirational teacher in our life and that teacher was mostly not in the college, it was somewhere in the school or at the pre-U level. So in that sense, the kind of power that the school teachers or the teachers at your level command is amazing. Now what we are trying to do here is understand the essence of NEP and trying to bring it into some kind of force. So I'll finish by saying that it's basically a very conscious process. And when I say conscious, one last thing, very, somebody made me this remark, think about it, what is the most distrusted or untrusted or non-trusted line of activity in India? Everybody would say politics. He told me, no, not politics, it's education, he said. I said, explain, look at education. 
teachers are not happy students are not happy family is not happy society is not happy industries is unemployable nobody is happy in politics at least politicians are happy now the point i'm talking about is now probably some little humor but it's 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 terribly uh, saddening state of affairs so somewhere i be believe that some change can happen so even if we take one aspect of what nep is trying to say in applying to whatever our context i think a lot of change could happen i am no big to either teach you something or tell you something new this is just sharing my experience in this journey of establishing of Chanakya University I thank you all very much thank you